Hello and welcome to the CPD video from the Scottish Lloydian Society on the topic of skilled persons in civil actions. I've deliberately not referred to skilled witnesses or expert witnesses for reasons that I hope will become clear. I'm going to speak on the subject generally but with particular emphasis on two subjects the first of which is the certification of what are termed skilled persons under the 2019 fees rules which are the ones that are currently in place and which you need to consider and the second topic on which I'll concentrate is the Supreme Court case of Kennedy versus Cordia this is one of these cases where um, it comes along every so often you get a case like this it essentially renders redundant uh, any references to previous authorities simply because it's so comprehensive and authoritative and this is one of those cases uh, if you read the case which I recommend that you do if you ever use expert witnesses or skilled persons uh, you should certainly read the case and you'll see there that uh, it's like a textbook but it's also a comprehensive, detailed and completely uh, authoritative textbook. So um, it's such a significant case in terms of expert w witnesses and skilled witnesses that you really need to look at it. Um, so I'll be looking at that later on. Um, as I say, together with the question of certification under the 2019 uh, rules. So I'll be speaking on, on, on the subject and um, the talk will count for CPD purposes. If you are a member of the Scottish Law Agent Society, then it's easy enough for you to get verification of your CPD. If you're not a member, then you will not be able to obtain verification and the time that you spend on this topic uh, here will not count towards uh, your CPD as far as the Law Society is concerned. So if you're not a member of SLAS please join and then watch and then claim your CPD. So before I talk about these two topics I want to, as I always do when I give talks, deal with the question of risk management because I'm a practitioner, I'm not an academic, I'm a solicitor advocate, I've been in practice for over 30 years, I've undertaken proofs in the Sheriff Court, in the Court of Session, I've used uh, skilled expert evidence uh, on many occasions. I'm not an academic however and I'm talking to you simply as a practitioner and I'm assuming that you too are a practitioner. And as one, one practitioner to another, I, um, I, I don't have any... Uh, hesitation in saying to you that the most important consideration as is the case in any area of work in which you're involved, the most important consideration is your own self-preservation. And um, I'm intending to start this talk with a wee bit of information about risk management. Um, you have to make sure that you cover your own back and if you are minded to instruct experts Bear in mind that they can be very expensive. If you think about it, if you're going into court as a, a witness, you have to be persuaded to do that. Obviously, if you're cited, you have to go to court. But if you're an expert, if you're a skilled person, you have to have a fairly good incentive to want to go into court at all. Because most people don't like going into court. Uh, even lawyers don't like going into court a lot of the time. But witnesses certainly don't enjoy giving evidence in court. With skilled persons, um, they, ha they have the additional uh, issue that they're putting their reputations on the line by giving evidence. If they give an opinion and that's not accepted by the court, to some extent that undermines their standing and reputation. And why would they risk that when they don't have to? So you can see why expert witnesses um, do charge a lot of money in some cases because it's not worth their while giving evidence otherwise. So 
it can be very expensive to instruct an expert and you as a practitioner have to find out about the costs at the outset and you have to make sure that you get instructions from the client to uh, incur these costs you also of course have to make sure that you are properly funded up front because the last thing you want is to find yourself with a huge bill that you don't have the funds to cover um, of course if it's a legal aid case you will have to get sanctioned from the board um, but whatever you do you have to make sure you have cover for the witness costs you will be aware that uh, there is a rule both in the Sheriff Court and indeed in the Court of Session that solicitors are personally liable for the expenses of witnesses whom they cite. Uh, the rules are it's Ordinary Cause Rule 2975 and Rule of the Court of Session 3624. Um, so they make you personally liable for the costs of a, of a witness, an expert witness or any kind of witness whom you actually cite. As far as uh, skilled persons who you instruct but don't cite, um, my own view of that is that you are not personally liable, certainly not under the rules, because they specifically refer to the citation of witnesses. However, there could well be circumstances where you are liable nevertheless or where the position is arguable under implied contract or something of that nature. And if you want to look into this, uh, I would recommend that you look at a case which is called White, W-I-G-H-T, Chiropractic Clinic Limited versus Corrie's Solicitors, Scotland, which is a decision from uh, Sheriff Scott, Sheriff Craig Scott, before he became Sheriff Principal in Glasgow, and it's from tw uh, the 12th of October 2005, and it's reported on the Scottish Courts and Tribunals uh, website. Um, this was a debate before Sheriff Scott, um, in which I appeared on behalf of the defender, the solicitors, and the situation was that there was a chiropractor employed by a company and the chiropractor was cited for a proof, it was a reparation proof. So he was cited and the proof didn't go ahead, I seem to remember. But anyway, he, um, he had been cited and the situation was that he himself had not suffered any loss or any expenses. He was paid his salary whether he'd gone or not, so he didn't suffer any personal loss. However, his employers uh, did suffer a loss insofar as he was taken away from doing other work on their behalf. And the situation was he didn't sue the solicitors, but his employer sued the solicitors. And the question then was whether the solicitors were personally liable to the employers even though the solicitors hadn't cited them in other words they cited him but not them but they were the ones making the claim uh, now my argument was that there was no personal liability to the, the employers under the rules and I, I moved to have the case dismissed uh, the sheriff um, clearly had very little sympathy with that and he wouldn't dismiss the action. There was then an appeal, there was an amendment, uh, but before the case reached the Sheriff Principal, and of course this was before the Sheriff Appeal Court was created, before it reached him, the case was settled. So the matter, in a way it was unfortunate because I'd have liked a determinative judgment on this, but the, the position was never f fully uh, decided by a court um, so the case in a sense was, was a wee bit inconclusive however the point that I would make from it or take from it is that while you may have a defence in law uh, you don't want to get into an argument about these matters um, 
the other thing you don't want is the expert or the experts employers or whoever it happens to be making a complaint about you to the SLCC so my recommendation is do not get into a situation where these things are an issue where you're getting faced with a claim or a complaint just don't go there because it's it's too risky in my opinion and it's unnecessary because uh, what you should do instead of getting into uh, risky territory like that is being clear at the outset what the risks are, what the costs are likely to be, and make sure you get money from the client as well. It's all about good communication early on. So that's that case. Um, the next point I would make again relates to your own personal position as a solicitor. Um, as far as your duties are concerned, in terms of a skilled person, the Supreme Court in the Kennedy versus Cordia case, which I'll come on to later on, but I'll mention it just now. The case provided some very clear directions about this. Um, and I'm, I'm quoting from the case where I say that uh, it falls in the first instance to counsel and solicitors who propose to adduce the evidence of a skilled witness to assess whether the proposed witness has the necessary expertise and whether his or her evidence is otherwise admissible. It's also their role to make sure that the proposed witness is aware of the duties imposed on an expert witness. So you have a duty to tell someone else about his or her duties. Um, so again, it's about communication early on so that everyone knows where they stand, what their responsibilities are, what their duties are, what their role is, uh, and if, it, if there's adequate communication, if there's good communication, there shouldn't be any problem about these things. So again, as a practitioner, um, you have a duty, a responsibility to recover your expert's costs, or at least some of those costs, in the event that your client is successful in the action. And this brings into play uh, the question of certification. Now, you need to be clear as to what is meant by a skilled person or as it's termed in the older authorities a skilled witness and this is an area of law where there have been really dramatic changes and you have to be aware of those and you also have to be aware of the dangers of relying on old textbooks because to a large extent they are now superfluous um, however um, there's never really been any change of uh, approach by the authorities on what constitutes a skilled witness um, per se. Uh, Walker and Walker on evidence. Um, my copy is a fourth edition. I know there's a fifth edition. I don't have that yet. Uh, but my edition is a fourth edition. I think it's probably just as valid as the fifth on this particular point. Um, there's a footnote there referring back to Dixon on evidence and Dixon um, states that a skilled witness is a person who through expertise or education or both is specially qualified in a recognised branch of knowledge whether it be art, science or craft. Um, so that's a good definition of a skilled witness. Um, now skilled witness is a term of art in, in a sense and it's also a wee bit of a misnomer because certainly these days it can cover someone who is not an, not a witness uh, but I'll come back to that later on but as far as certification is concerned um, you need this if you're going to try and recover probably most of your witnesses expenses from the other side um, but let me be clear at the moment about what's meant by certification. Certification is solely to do with whether a successful party can recover from the opponent the expenses of employing an expert to provide a report or other material or evidence in a case. That's the only purpose of certification. As you may know, um, in terms of the 
the rules governing expenses, the amount that can be recovered by a, a general witness, an ordinary witness, the amount that can be recovered by that person is capped. In terms of the Act of Sederant uh, Taxation of Judicial Expenses Rules 2019, Schedule 6, um, the cap is £400 a day. In fact, there's a wee bit more to it than that. What the rule says is that um, the liability of a party calling a witness is to reimburse financial loss reasonably incurred by the witness in consequence of being cited or requested to appear, not exceeding £400 a day. So that liability exists. There's also in addition a liability to reimburse uh, expenses reasonably incurred by the witness in travelling to the court, those travelling expenses. There's also uh, a liability for subsistence, which is probably not a great deal, although of course it would include accommodation costs if the witness has to travel a, a fair distance and maybe stay overnight somewhere. Um, and in fact, yeah, the rule goes on to say that the reasonable cost of board and lodgings so far as reasonably incurred is an additional um, cost that you will have to, to meet. Um, now, the um, costs, those particular costs, of course, are, are, are costs that you will have to, your client will have to meet. Um, if the client loses the case, of course, then certification and such like probably doesn't matter very much. But if your client wins, uh, you'll have to get certification in order to recover uh, costs from the opponent. Uh, if those costs are over and above the ones that I've mentioned, because the cap, the £400 cap, does not apply where the witness is a skilled witness. A consequence of that would also be, of course, that if you have a, wit a skilled witness who isn't, who is ultimately not certified by the court, you'll still be able to recover some of those costs. You'll be able to recover up to four hundred pounds a day, plus the subsistence and travelling expenses and such like. You'll still be able to recover those because the witness would simply be treated as a normal witness. But if you're looking for more than that, you have to obtain certification from the court that the witness is skilled. Um, if that happens, if there is certification, then the cap flies off and the the only restriction then is that it has to be an amount of, of cost that the auditor of court thinks is reasonable. So, um, if you're acting for a litigant who has an expert witness or a skilled witness and you win, it's absolutely critical that you get certification if you're looking to recover that witness's uh, expenses over and above the £400 a day. Time limit for seeking certification. Uh, this is a, a really important thing um, and it's one where again there's a real danger in relying on the old textbooks because the 2019 Act of Sederant uh, radically changed the law on this. It used to be that you would seek certification after the witness had uh, undertaken his or her work and appeared in court or whatever it was that had happened. But now uh, the rules require that certification be sought before the skilled person carries out work. Uh, there are one or two exceptions to this. Uh, skilled, um, simple procedure it doesn't apply in simple procedure. I think in some personal injuries cases, there's not that restriction either. Um, and of course, there is always the possibility of seeking retrospective certification on cause shown. But of course, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever recommend relying on that. Um, you shouldn't have to rely on that. If you do your job properly, you should be able to get certification in advance. So try and get that in advance of any work that's undertaken. Uh, as I say, this is entirely at odds with how 
procedure used to be before. Um, so if you look at old textbooks, for example, the ones I looked at were there was one on, on court session practice by Balfour from 1922, 100 years ago, almost. Uh, Doby on sheriff court practice, Maxwell on court of session practice. They all refer to the, the need to seek certification at the end of a proof or within seven days after a judgment's issued. Uh, that's the old procedure. You must appreciate that. That's not the, the procedure now. Um, now you can see why that might have been justified, of course, because in a sense, only after the court has heard the witness and the other evidence can the judge or the sheriff properly be in a position to assess whether certification would be appropriate. Um, you know, it's only really at that point that, that the reasonableness or otherwise of the certification can really properly be judged. Um, now, of course, because certification is being granted up front in advance, you might say the court's not really as well able to judge the reasonableness of certification. Um, and I see that, that's, that's an argument. Um, the advantage, of course, from your own perspective as a practitioner is that um, at least you know whether you're going to rec be able to recover the additional costs before you instruct the expert. In, in a sense, you're better knowing and it, you're better knowing first rather than later on. Um, under the previous system, you'd, your client would be incurring these costs without knowing whether they would be recoverable or not, whereas at least now you do know. So from a solicitor's perspective, it's actually quite a good change. What's the test for granting certification? Now, again, the law has been changed uh, quite radically by the Act of Sedarin of 2019. Um, it simply has to be reasonable and proportionate. And in my view, this is a much more sensible test than the old one. Uh, reasonable is always a good test. Um, it's not always predictable how a matter will go based on reasonableness, but it, it's a good measure of whether something should be done or shouldn't be done, by, by which I mean certification. Now, um, the new test, of course, includes this phrase proportionate, which is a good idea as well, because it clearly would not be proportionate or reasonable to pay, for example, a building engineer to uh, look at a, a problem if the, 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 the engineer was, say, charging two and a half thousand pounds, but the claim was only worth eight, 8 thousand pounds, let's say. Say it was a, a defective house extension and you were arguing about eight thousand pounds. A bill of two and a half thousand pounds to an expert, I don't really think that would be proportionate. Um, however, these things may, you know, go a different way depending on the circumstances and I suppose the extent to which the expert is necessary and wh how many experts there are out there. Some some areas of, of activity can be quite specialised, so there's no hard and fast rule on it. But again, proportionate, I think, is a good idea. Under the, the previous law, um, the situation was a lot more uh, complicated and inflexible. Uh, for one thing, it had to be necessary to employ somebody to make investigations previous to a trial or a proof in order to qualify him or her to give evidence. That had to be done. Um, the person had to make inquiries or carry out investigations in, in order to enable him or her to give evidence. And the, the old authorities refer to uh, fees being reasonable for the trouble and expense that the person incurred in making these investigations. Um, so, for example, Balfour on court of session practice says the fees will only be allowed if the witness has done something such as visiting the locus or making special experiments. Uh, Doby also refers to this 
he says that skilled witnesses are entitled to special charges for making investigations prior to a proof or trial to qualify them for giving evidence. Um, he also talks about skilled persons as including not only professional or scientific witnesses but any other skilled person who was reasonably entitled to visit a locus or examine work or make calculations or otherwise occupy time before the date of the proof or trial in order to qualify himself for giving evidence. Um, MacPhail, now I've only got the second edition of MacPhail from 1998. Um, the author makes points uh, there, some of which are still up to date. The point, for example, that a skilled witness doesn't have to have a special technical qualification. I think that's always been the law, still the law. But on the whole, MacPhail, certainly my edition of MacPhail, and I think the third as well, I think the third edition is the same, um, will have been superseded entirely by, by, by other developments. And certainly the third edition of MacPhail was long before the 2019 Act and long before uh, Kennedy versus Cordia. But I would expect that the fourth edition, which is probably coming out in 2022 at some point, uh, will take account of, of these developments. So it's, it's, it's probably going to be quite reliable as far as that's concerned. Anyway, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time looking at what the law used to be. Um, there isn't much point in that, although I would say that actions raised before the 2019 Act of Sedarent are governed by the previous law, so you have to be mindful of that. Um, but generally speaking, what the law used to be probably isn't very important any longer. Um, it is important, however, that I mention it just so you know that things change a lot and the law has changed pretty radically on this and pretty recently, so you have to keep up to date. Um, so, uh, as I say, at one time you used to have to have um, a skilled witness uh, having carried out, you know, would be carrying out um, inquiries or investigations, um, and that was the case right up until pretty recently. Um, There were a lot of changes on this, in fact, quite uh, quite recently. The, the annotated courts, uh, notes to the Court of Session rules, which I have, um, make the point that there was an act of sedated from 2006, which changed the rules so that certification would be allowed if it were reasonable rather than necessary to employ a skilled person. Um, there was... Um, a change so that there didn't, need, there didn't need to be investigations, reports were covered and it wasn't required that the investigations or reports had to be necessary to qualify the person to give evidence. Um, there was a further act of sedere in 2011 so that um, the person to be certified need not actually be a witness and the charges recoverable would extend to any purpose in connection with the cause or in contemplation of the cause. So these changes had been made, but they're all made clear in the 2019 rules. So it used to be that there had to be a proof before you could ask for certification. There, that's no longer the case. And um, there, there does not need to be a proof now. One of the reasons why they took the word witness out of the, the rules was that, in a sense, you can't really have a witness unless there's a proof. But they wanted to make sure that persons who were engaged to give uh, evidence or make opinion uh, reports or such like would be covered, uh, even if there wasn't a proof. So the 2019 rules that apply are rules uh, 4.5, and 5.3. And the first of these, four, four, five, says that no charge incurred to a person who's been engaged for the purposes of the application of that person's skill is to be allowed as an outlay unless the person has been certified as a skilled person in accordance with Rule 5.3. 
and except where paragraph 4 applies, the charge relates to work done or expenses incurred after the date of certification. Paragraph 4, I think, refers to retrospective sanction. Um, but uh, those are the rules. It states also where a person has been so certified the auditor is to allow charges for work done or expenses reasonably incurred by that person which were reasonably required for a purpose in connection with the proceedings or in contemplation of the proceedings. So it's much wider. Nothing there about having to undertake inquiries or investigations. It's simply that it, um, the, the work was done um, and costs were reasonably incurred reasonably required for the pur for a purpose in connection with the proceedings or in contemplation of the proceedings so um, that is the rule that's 4-5 um, which I've referred to 5-3 says and this is uh, under the heading of certification of skilled persons 5-3 says that on the application of a party the court may certify a person as a skilled person for the purpose of Rule 4.5, the one we've just looked at, um, and the court may grant such an application if satisfied that the person is a skilled person and it is or was reasonable and proportionate that the person should be employed. So that's the reasonable and proportionate test that I've already referred to. So again, you know, we see the word person cropping up here a good few times, um, but there's no mention of witness. And as I said, um, the, the omission of the word witness is quite deliberate. And um, it was designed to overcome the situations where there have been cases where somebody uh, who'd been engaged as, a, as an expert couldn't be treated as a witness and therefore couldn't be certified where no proof had been allowed. Um, incidentally, there was something that I noticed, I hadn't realised this, but when I was looking into this matter, I noticed that there was a blunder in the rules insofar as allowing, as far as allowing retrospective sanction, the rules provide that where the sheriff has determined that certification has effect for the purposes of work done or expenses incurred before the date of certification um, there, there, there can be retrospective certification but the rule insofar as it refers to the sheriff is a bit a bit of a mistake because the rules apply equally in the court of session and it wasn't me that I didn't come up with this idea by the way I noticed it in a case that's uh, referred to Again, on the Scottish Courts and Tribunals website, it's a case of Vicky Davidson and Grampian Health Board, which is reported on the, the decision rather the 24th of May 2019, in which this anomaly was discussed. It's clearly just a mistake, but anyway. The um, point I would make here is skilled witnesses instructed before the proceedings are raised. Clearly, you cannot have certification in advance if there's no ongoing litigation. Um, certification in that situation of necessity will have to be retrospective. Um, however, I don't think there would be a problem about that because if it's reasonable to instruct somebody before you raise an action, say there's an imminent time bar, some similar urgency. Uh, in my view, it's highly unlikely that the court will take the view that it's unreasonable for you to instruct a skilled witness or a skilled person. So it should be fine as long as it's justified. But again, you know, you would have to warn the client that there's a danger that you might not get certification. So um, I hope I've said enough about certification of witnesses. And um, 
what I would say just in summary about it is just make sure that you look at the up to date rules on this because there's an awful lot of stuff out there in textbooks that's entirely out of date and you know there's a huge risk in relying on old textbooks because they'll completely mislead you as to what the law is at the moment um, before I move on one matter where it is still the law and it always has been the law um, sometimes the, the question will come up can a skilled witness and it, and it is a witness in this case a wit skilled witness sit through the evidence of other witnesses uh, before he or she gives evidence himself or herself well the answer to that is yes if it concerns witnesses speaking to facts and not opinion and if the court allows it so the old authorities you know Balfour for example says scientific witnesses may be present during the examination of witnesses to facts but not when other scientific witnesses are being examined uh, Doby makes the same point at page 214 of his book from 1948 um, an exception to the exclusion from court of unexamined witnesses is commonly made in the case of skilled witnesses who are to speak to matters of opinion but this is a matter of arrangement and the leave of the court or the consent of the other party should be obtained I would have thought it would be both the leave of the court and the consent of the other party should be Anyway, as a rule, such witnesses should not hear each other's evidence. Uh, a skilled witness called to give an opinion is entitled to hear stated or to read a statement of the facts in regard to which he is asked to express an opinion. And uh, Maxwell says that at page, page 304, a motion should be made at the beginning of a proof to enable an expert who is to give opinion evidence to hear the witnesses who depone to the facts. Um, the annotated rules of the court of session, they refer to the rule, it's rule 3693, that no witness shall, except with the leave of the court, be present in the courtroom during the proceedings prior to the giving of his evidence. The note says it's, that leave is often sought and granted to allow a skilled witness to hear the evidence of an opponent witness uh, but not usually an opponent's skilled witness. So, according to all these textbooks, and as I understand it, this is still a position, um, no witness, not even a skilled witness, can sit through the evidence of other witnesses unless the court permits that. And it's envisaged that leave would only be granted to let the skilled witness hear the witnesses speaking to matters of fact and not opinion. Now, my view, uh, my view is that it's generally best not to have your skilled witness listen to someone else's evidence, even a witness who's speaking to matters of fact, um, simply because, it's be in my opinion, it's better to have the expert evidence given on the basis of facts that the, the court can see and um, that way you know the you know what the, you know what the opinion is predicated upon whereas if you hear you know how it is you get if you're hearing ex, um, witnesses speaking to matters of fact they're bound to deviate to some extent from what they've said in previous pleadings or reports or correspondence or productions or such like and to my mind it simply muddies the waters if you've got an expert witness or skilled witness giving evidence after you've heard witnesses speaking to matters of fact I don't I don't see the point of that at all I think you're much better having the expert give his, his or her opinion based on material that that's provided to him or her and which can be shown to the court if necessary or which is there in the form of a production or is even referred to in the report itself by the expert. Um, I remember I once had a proof in Stranraer Sheriff Court in which both my client and the opponent had equine vets 
from Newmarket who were there to give expert evidence and I asked the sheriff and Sheriff Smith at that time if my expert could sit through the evidence of other witnesses as to fact and he, he was very unhappy about that and um, asked if I had an authority that would allow that and I referred him to McPhail on Sheriff Court Practice but the sheriff noted that the footnote referred to McPhail on evidence and he, he didn't seem very impressed that the author referred to another of his own works as an authority for a proposition that, that uh, he was seeking to make and he refused the motion which actually was the right decision uh, I think anyway another topic that I wanted to speak about and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this is how do you effectively cross-examine an expert witness now if the expert is a lawyer you are on steadier ground simply because you're talking the same language to some extent as the expert so I've had cases uh, on conveyance and I'm not a conveyancer um, but I've had cases involving con conveyancing issues and I've I've had expert witnesses who were conveyancing lawyers so on one occasion I had as a witness the late Professor Robert Rennie who was there to speak about non-classic letters of obligation and the risks involved in granting those uh, which risks are considerable I, I learnt and um, on another in another occasion I had uh, Donald Reed gave evidence in relation to uh, the duties of a solicitor in, in relation to conveyancing transactions and conflict of interest and such like so where, where you've got uh, an expert or a skilled witness who's another solicitor it can be I'm not saying it's easy but it, it's less of a challenge to try and cross-examine someone um, who's in your field as it were um, I've had to cross-examine other lawyer experts for example uh, Bill McCreth and whilst it's not easy uh, at least you're talking the same language and even to an extent accountant evidence um, is in our language as well accountants to some extent do what we do and I've had cases where I've had to cross-examine accountants and I had one in Paisley where the uh, question in fact I had one in Paisley and one in Edinburgh where they were both to do with reports on lost profits and I'm not saying again that it's easy but at least with accountants you can try and analyse their methods and in both those cases I was cross-examining on the factors that the accountants had used the uh, outlays, uh, overheads, the costs, the expenses that they'd taken into account, what they'd left out of account, how they worked out uh, profitability and such like and it's, it is possible to at least have a go at, at, at shaking uh, the reliability of the evidence of some some types of expert where I think it's a lot more challenging is where you're dealing with somebody like a medical expert or a scientist and it's tricky simply by reason of the fact that it's so out with our field that you will be nowhere near as knowledgeable about the subject matter under scrutiny as the witness that you're seeking to challenge um, I mean who are you as a lawyer to question a doctor's assessment of the seriousness of an injury for example and you know you're not it's not your field I mean that's why you're employed that's why these experts are employed because it's not it's not within the normal field of a court or a lawyer there's also not a lot of technical language used and it's just a it's like a foreign land in some ways uh, so it's, it's it can be very difficult to shake um, expert witnesses in these areas 
and quite often if you don't have your own expert you, you really could be on a, on a hiding to nothing um, this is going back to the question of uh, risk assessment this is why lawyers will quite often want to instruct their own expert if the opponent has one and of course there are serious risks if you don't get your own expert because then for one thing the sheriff or the judge doesn't have any contrary opinion expert evidence to consider um, what you can do in cross-examination I suppose is try and weaken the reliability of the facts underlying the experts opinion you can do that um, in other words don't attack the opinion but attack the facts upon which the opinion is predicated but I suppose in one sense that's not attacking the, the expert witness that's attacking the, the extraneous matter upon which the, the expert is relying you can of course put and you should put the evidence of your own expert and in fact if you're doing your, your job properly what you would do is ascertain what your expert um, the, the, the opponent's expert is likely to say put that to your own expert find out what he or she thinks about that use that as the basis of your cross-examination and um, that's probably the best way of cross-examining um, it can be a challenge though to cross-examining uh, medical experts I, I have found that on a few occasions I once had a proof in Edinburgh Sheriff Court where I had to cross-examine a doctor by the name of Mr McMaster uh, now Mr McMaster had very strong opinions on whiplash injuries and he was a he was a tough witness to shake and I remember asking him if he was aware of a paper on whiplash injuries written by two eminent medical men and in which the views expressed were different from his upon which he said yes I, I edited that paper he knew all about it uh, he wasn't the least bit shaken or hesitant about giving his own opinions simply because someone else had expressed different views so it can be very difficult to, to cross examine expert witnesses and um, you just have to I suppose rely on your own expert evidence and use that so I hope I've said enough about skilled witnesses uh, as regards um, certification and as regards cross-examination I'd like to move on now if I may to the case of Kennedy against Cordia Services now this case which I've mentioned a couple of times already is a case from 2016 and it's reported well, the citation I've got here in front of me, UK SC, UK Supreme Court 6, that's from 2016. The background to this case is that Mrs. Kennedy was employed by Cordia as a, a home carer, and on the 18th of December 2010, she was uh, driven by a colleague to the home of an old lady in Glasgow. And was dropped at the end of an icy footpath along which she made her way of course you know what you know the way this is going she slipped and fell and she injured her wrist and proceedings were raised in the court of session and in the outer house Lord McEwen heard evidence including the evidence of Mr. Lenford Greasley, who was a consulting engineer, now evidence was uh, led by Mr. Or from Mr. Greasley, on behalf of the pursuer, Miss Kennedy, under objection. Uh, now, Mr. Greasley's qualifications included a degree in engineering and a diploma in safety and hygiene. He was a chartered member of the Institute of Safety and Health and an associate member of the UK Slip Resistance Group. He was also a former member of the Health and Safety Executive, in which he had worked as an inspector of factories. He'd held senior management positions in industry, 
in, in areas including health and safety. And he'd worked for many years as an engineering consultant advising companies on health and safety, including carrying out slip testing and advising on the adequacy of risk assessments. And he carried out or revised between 50 and 100 risk assessments. Anyway, the Lord Ordinary accepted Mr. Greasley's evidence and he found in favour of the pursuer. The matter was then um, the subject of a reclaiming motion went to the inner house. The inner house reversed the decision of the outer house. Mrs. Kennedy then appealed that decision to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in turn reversed the decision of the inner house. So ultimately Mrs. Kennedy was successful. The importance of the case for present purposes lies in the fact that of the five justices who heard the Supreme Court appeal, two, that's Lords Reed and Hodge, both Scottish, they gave judgments which deal with the evidence of skilled witnesses in Scots law concerning admissibility the responsibility of the party's legal team, well, we've already touched upon that, the court's policing of the carrying out of these duties, and what was described as economy in litigation. Of those topics, the, the one that seemed to take up most time was the question of admissibility. And I think it's fair to say that was the main issue that the Supreme Court considered um, before Kennedy and uh, Kennedy versus Cordia was decided, Walker's on evidence from 2015 states that uh, the evidence of skilled witnesses relating to human behaviour and beha sorry, human nature and behaviour within the limits of normality is normally regarded as inadmissible. Um, and the paragraph is aimed primarily at criminal proceedings but applies to civil actions as well and I suppose the point there is that normal matters are within the knowledge of the finder of facts within judicial knowledge so skilled evidence is of no use um, walkers also say that if the opinion of a skilled witness is not based on the principles of some recognised branch of knowledge it's useless and probably inadmissible because it cannot be tested by cross-examination. Uh, accordingly, the qualification and experience of the skilled witness must first be established. Um, so you'll see there that there's a reference to the uh, inadmissibility of evidence, which is one of the in fact, the main issue that the, the court, the Supreme Court, looked at. Um, and the Supreme Court looked at the evidence of Mr. Greasley, the, the, the skilled witness. As I say, his evidence was given in the, the outer house uh, under objection. So the, the, the Supreme Court looked at this and they remarked that uh, the use of expert witnesses who in Scottish practice have traditionally been described as skilled witnesses can provide significant benefits to the court in determining legal disputes. Uh, there's a degree of commonality of approach between jurisdictions which adopt similar methods of fact finding. Thus, Scots law has drawn on the experience of other jurisdictions, both as to the admissibility of skilled evidence and in relation to the duties of expert witnesses. There are also concerns, and this is again from the Supreme Court's decision, there's also concerns about the use of skilled witnesses, some of which may have lain behind the extra div divisions approach in this case. Uh, Walker & Walker, 4th edition, 2015, record concerns about the excessive use of experts in litigation in other jurisdictions and referred to Lord Cullen's proposal to restrict the number of skilled witnesses in his review of Outer House Business in 1995. In the view of the Supreme Court, judges who frequently decide civil cases should, through their experience, be less likely than juries to be unduly influenced by skilled witnesses. 
but an advocate in a civil case may face difficulties in testing the evidence of an expert unless assisted by other expert advice. This is the point I made earlier about how to cross-examine. The need to regulate such evidence remains, said the Supreme Court. In this case, this is the Cordia case, the, the extra division's principal concerns about Mr Greasley's evidence were that he'd expressed opinions on what Cordia should have done that involved uh, questions of law and it was the task of the court to decide those. Uh, Lord Brodie, who uh, gave the leading judgement in the inner house, stated that he, that he that's Mr uh, a Greasley should not have been allowed to give quite a bit of the evidence that uh, the Lord Ordinary took into account and uh, Lord Brodie was very very critical of the Outer House judge he said at one point that the judge had abdicated his role as decision maker which is strong stuff um, the dispute that had to be resolved was something that the Lord Ordinary was fully equipped to do without any instruction or advice. It was squarely within his province as judicial decision maker. No additional expertise was required. That's what Lord Brodie thought. Um, health and safety, he said, was not an area of expertise since it was not a recognised body of science or experience. And the other members of the court agreed with that. Um, Lord Clark commented that the Lord Ordinary's approach was simply to accept that the evidence of Mr Greasley determined the question for him and paragraph 43 of the Lord Ordinary's opinion demonstrated a shifting of his responsibility for deciding the issues before him to Mr Greasley. Lord Clark uh, expressed concerns more generally about the unnecessary proliferation of uh, expert reports in personal injury cases and the extra division uh, articulated their more general concerns about um, the use of skilled witnesses in connection with health and safety issues and in particular the, the practice of employers um, and again they, they looked at whether it was um, a recognised body of science or experience which was suitably acknowledged as being useful or reliable and which could properly form the basis of opinions capable of being subjected to forensic evaluation. Um, however, by the time the matter reached the Supreme Court, counsel for Cordia conceded at the outset of the appeal that so general an assertion by the extra division was not correct and council accepted that health and safety practice could properly be the subject of expert evidence. And the Supreme Court said, we think that that concession was correctly made. In other words, the, the inner house got that wrong. Um, so the Supreme Court looked at Mr. Greasley's evidence and um, did so uh, in a fair amount of depth but before it did that it looked at expert evidence more generally and that's probably where the value of this case lies primarily for, for our purposes and I mean, this is why I say that if you use an expert witness or a skilled person at all in connection with litigation you should really look at this judgement because it covers every expert witness um, the expert, um, sorry, the Supreme Court made a number of points that are of universal application. So they said that uh, as regards the evidence of skilled witnesses, um, there were four matters that fell to be addressed. The first one was the admissibility of evidence, of such evidence rather. The th second was the responsibility of a party's legal team to make sure that the expert keeps to his or her role of giving the court useful information. The third issue was the court's policing of the performance of the expert's duties and the fourth one was economy and litigation. And as far as um, admissibility is concerned, the court said that 
uh, skilled witnesses, unlike other witnesses, can give evidence of their opinions to assist the court. Um, and this gives rise to what was described as a threshold, sorry, to, to threshold questions of the admissibility of expert evidence. And an example of expert evidence would be whether Mrs. Miss Kennedy would have been less likely to fall if she'd been wearing anti-slip attachments on her footwear. The court also made the point, which is a really good point to make, that experts can and often do give e evidence of fact as well as opinion evidence. Um, a skilled witness like a non-expert witness can give evidence of what he or she has observed if it's relevant to uh, a fact and issue. And an example was in connection with Mr. Greasley, it was his evidence of the slope of the pavement on which Miss Kennedy had lost her footing. So they just make the point that skilled witnesses can quite often give uh, evidence on matters of fact as well, as did Mr. Greasley. And the courts say that there are no special rules governing the admissibility of such factual evidence from a skilled witness. Um, unlike other witnesses, a skilled witness may also give evidence based on his or her knowledge and experience of a subject matter, drawing on the work of others such as the findings of published research or the pooled knowledge of a team of people with whom he or she works. Um, such evidence also gives rise to threshold questions of admissibility and the special rules that govern the admissibility of expert opinion evidence also cover such expert evidence of fact and there's reference to various uh, examples of that Dixon on evidence uh, there's a case Gibson versus Pollock from 1848 a case in which a court admitted evidence of practice in dog coursing to determine whether the owner was entitled to a prize. Um, similarly, the court went on where an engineer describes how a machine is configured or works or how a motorway is built. He is giving skilled evidence of factual matters in which he or she draws on knowledge that is not derived solely from personal observation or its equivalent. Um, an expert in the social and political conditions in a foreign country who gives evidence to an immigration judge also gives skilled evidence of fact. Uh, the court also mentioned that in trials in Scotland it's quite common for the Crown to adduce the evidence of a, a policeman who has the experience and knowledge to describe the quantities of drugs that people tend to keep for personal use rather than for supply. And they refer to a case that called before the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, um, Myers, Brangman and Cox versus the Queen, this is from 2015, a case where um, the court approved of the use of police officers who had special training and experience of the practices of criminal gangs. The court said that it was uh, it was fine for such witnesses to give evidence on the culture of gangs, their places of association, the signs that they use, and the Supreme Court made the point that in giving such factual evidence, the um, skilled witness can draw on the general body of knowledge and understanding in which he is skilled, including the work and literature of others. Um, however, they went on to say that the skilled witness must set out his qualifications by training and experience to give expert evidence and also say from where he's obtained information if it's not based on his own observations and experience. So um, it's interesting that they, they're, they're looking there at the expert who is essentially giving evidence based on his or her knowledge of um, facts in other instances or um, facts derived from the research or observations of others. The court noted that um, there was a, 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 a well, reference by counsel in that case to a, a case from Australia, uh, the case of R versus 
Bonnie Thorn from 1984, um, which is quite a good guide on the admissibility of expert opinion evidence from Australia. Uh, and it, there was a passage there that's, that was approved by the, the Supreme Court uh, in which the, the court in Australia had said that before admitting the opinion of a witness into evidence uh, as expert testimony, the judge must consider and decide two questions. The first is whether the subject matter of the opinion falls within the class of subjects upon which expert testimony is permissible. And this first question may be divided into two parts. A. Whether the subject matter of the opinion is such that a person without instruction or experience in the area of knowledge or human experience would be able to form a sound judgment on the matter without the assistance of witnesses possessing special knowledge or experience in the area. And B. Whether the subject matter of the opinion forms part of a body of knowledge or experience which is sufficiently organised and recognised to be accepted as a reliable body of knowledge or experience, a special acquaintance with which the witness would render uh, would, re would render his opinion of assistance to the court. So, um, this reference to you know, a body of knowledge or experience. This was the question that then our house looked at, you know, in terms of health and safety. Um, so that was referred to in the, the Australian case and the second point that the Australian case made was uh, that, that the court would have to ask whether the witness has acquired by study or experience sufficient knowledge of the subject to render his opinion of value in resolving the issues before the court. Now the Supreme Court obviously had quite a lot of regard to that, that opinion and um, went on to say that a skilled person can give expert factual evidence either by itself or in combination with opinion evidence and there, there are in the or there were in the view of the Supreme Court four considerations which govern the admissibility of skilled evidence and this is a really good uh, summary um, and as I say this, this applies to any skilled witness. The first issue is whether the proposed skilled evidence will assist the court. In other words, is it of use to the court? If it's not, there's no point in hearing it. Um, if it will assist the court, then that's 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 one of the hurdles uh, overcome. Second point, whether the witness has the, has the necessary knowledge and experience. In other words, does the witness have the sufficient credentials to be able to give the, the evidence? The third point is whether the witness is impartial in his or her presentation and assessment of the evidence. And the fourth point was whether there is a reliable body of knowledge or experience to underpin the expert's evidence. So these are the four considerations governing admissibility of expert evidence. Um, the court went on to say that all four considerations apply to opinion evidence, although when the first consideration is applied to opinion evidence, the, the, the threshold is the necessity of such evidence. In other words, if it's not going to be of assistance to the court, it's unnecessary. Um, the four considerations also apply to skilled evidence of fact, where the skilled witness draws on the knowledge and experience of others rather than his, um, rather than or in addition to personal observation or its equivalent. Now, will the evidence assist the court? Now, what the Supreme Court said that said was that it's up to it's up to the sheriff or the judge to decide uh, whether expert evidence is needed, where there is an, a, a challenge to the admissibility of the evidence. In other words, if you've got a skilled witness and there's a challenge to the admissibility of that evidence, it's up to the court, the court that hears the facts. To make the decision as to whether that expert evidence is needed, um, and there's a reference to Davidson's book on, on evidence from 2007, um, where there's a citation of um, a reference to a, a, a 
statement by Lord Justice Lawton in the case of R versus Turner from 1975 where the Lord Justice says if on the proven facts a judge or jury can form their own conclusions without help then the opinion of an expert is unnecessary which is clear enough clear point um, there's a reference to Wilson against HMA from 2009 justiciary cases 336 and in that case Lord Wheatley said the subject matter under discussion must be necessary for the proper resolution of the dispute and be such that a judge or jury without instruction or advice in the particular area of knowledge or expertise would be unable to reach a sound conclusion without the help of a witness who had such specialised knowledge or experience. So much the same point as R versus Turner. Um, the Supreme Court then goes on to say that most of the Scottish case law on and academic discussion of expert evidence has focused on opinion evidence to the exclusion of skilled evidence of fact, which is is correct if you if you look back through the the books and the the, the cases and such like you you do find that that's that is true. There has been more of a focus on it on opinion evidence rather than um, skilled evidence of fact. Um, the Supreme Court says that in their view the test for the admissibility of the latter form of evidence that skilled evidence of fact uh, cannot be strict necessity as otherwise the court could be deprived of the benefit of a skilled witness who collates and presents to the court in an efficient manner the knowledge of others in, in his or her field of expertise um, they say that there may be circumstances in which a court could determine a fact and issue without an expert collation of relevant facts if the parties called many factual witnesses at great expense and therefore uh, a strict necessity test would not be met. Um, there's a reference then by the Supreme Court to an American case, Supreme Court case in fact, Daubert against Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals from 1993 and Justice Blackman says in that case that if scientific, technical or other specialised knowledge will assist the trier of fact to understand the evidence or to determine a fact and issue a witness qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training or education may testify thereto in the form of an opinion or otherwise And the court, Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, that is, said that the advantages of the formula in this rule, the advantages that it avoids an over rigid interpretation of necessity, where a skilled witness is put forward to present relevant factual evidence in an efficient manner rather than to give an opinion explaining the factual evidence of others. And they say, if skilled evidence of fact would be likely to assist the efficient determination of the case, the judge should admit it. So it's useful this in so far as they're saying that courts should admit the evidence of a witness who is uh, speaking about um, essentially factual evidence. Um, if that will facilitate the efficient disposal of the business before the court, um, you know, efficient, uh, efficient determination of the case. So they seem to be encouraging that form of, of evidence, which is, is interesting. They, they say, um, I suppose as a sort of caveat there, that the expert does have to explain the basis of his or her evidence which is not based on personal observation or sensation um, so in other words they have to explain um, why they have um, given an opinion and they have to explain their um, 
a foundation, if you like, for, for giving the opinion and also for expressing the 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 the, the, um, the factual um, evidence of, of of others. The court went on to say that in Davy, this is the case of Davy against the magistrates of Edinburgh from 1953. Uh, Lord President Cooper said that expert witness evidence cannot usurp the functions of the the judge or the jury. Um, that's that's a well known uh, dictum from him. And recently they said that in the case of Pora against the Queen from 2015, which was an appeal from New Zealand, um, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council said that the uh, duty of an expert witness is to provide material on which a court can form its own conclusions on relevant issues. Uh, on occasions that may involve the witness expressing an opinion about which, for example, but whether, for example, an individual suffered from a particular condition or vulnerability. The expert witness should be careful to recognise, however, the need to avoid supplanting the court's role as the ultimate decision maker on matters that are central to the outcome of the case. Um, so they, they're saying there, I suppose, that on occasion, you know, to avoid elusive language, they say the skilled witness may have to express his or her views in a way that addresses the ultimate issue before the court, but expert assistance does not extend to supplanting the court as the decision maker. Uh, the fact finding judge cannot delegate the decision making role to the expert. So that's, that's what they were saying under this heading about assisting the court. They then go on to deal with um, the witnesses knowledge and expertise and uh, as I've referred to already the skilled witness has to demonstrate to the court that he or she has relevant knowledge and experience to give either factual evidence uh, which is not based exclusively on personal observations or sensation or opinion evidence and where the skilled witness establishes such knowledge and experience he or she can draw on the general body of knowledge and understanding of the relevant uh, expertise. The next point they made was under the heading of impartiality and other duties. And I suppose it's self-evident that a skilled witness has to be impartial. Um, you have to be careful, I think, in ensuring that it doesn't appear to the court that your expert is too close to the client. Um, I had a case once in which uh, the, the expert referred to the client by her first name. I looked terrible. Um, it just looked as if they were too too friendly. So you have to make sure that the, the, the expert is impartial and that they understand they have to be impartial. And if they can't be impartial, they shouldn't be involved. And you have to make sure that it's clear to the court that the, the, the expert is impartial because it's, an, it's essential to their uh, qualification to give the, the evidence that they are impartial. The Supreme Court said that the skilled witness must demonstrate to the court that he or she has um, relevant... Hang on. Yeah, they, they have to be able to demonstrate that um, they are impartial um, if a party proffers an expert report which on its, on the face of it does not comply with the recognised duties of a skilled witness to be independent and impartial, the court may exclude the evidence as inadmissible. Um, but the requirement of independence and impartiality in their view, in the court's view, is one of admissibility rather than the mere weight of evidence. Um, so in other words it's not enough to say the witness may be partial but that that lightens the weight to be given to his or her evidence it's a question of admissibility if the witness is not independent and impartial then the evidence should not be admitted at all uh, the court 
the Supreme Court say that the, the Scottish courts have adopted the guidance of Justice Cresswell on an expert's duties, and that's in the, in, uh, with reference to the case of the Acarian Reefer from 1993. Um, and Lord, uh, sorry, Justice Cresswell had summar summarised the position by saying that the duties and responsibilities of expert witnesses in civil cases include the following. Number one, expert evidence presented to the court should be and should be seen to be the independent product of the expert uninfluenced as to form or content uh, by the exigencies of litigation. Uh, secondly, an expert witness should provide independent assistance to the court by way of objective, unbiased opinion in relation to matters within his expertise. An expert witness in the High Court, that's the English High Court I suppose, uh, should never assume the role of an advocate. Thirdly, an expert witness should state the facts or assumption on which his opinion is based and should not omit to consider material facts which could detract from his concluded opinion. So clearly um, the opinion evidence of an expert, as I said earlier, is pr it must be predicated on facts and these have to be stated by the expert or they have to be clear. It has to be clear um, how the, the the facts have to be clear the facts that have um, been relied upon by the expert in his uh, giving of an e of, of an ex of expert uh, evidence and importantly if there's anything factual that um, undermines the strength of the opinion then that should be referred to as well um, the fourth point was an expert witness should make it clear when a particular question or issue falls out with his expertise and fifthly, if an expert's opinion is not properly researched because he considers that insufficient data is available, then this must be stated with an indication that the opinion is no more than a provisional one. In cases where an expert witness who has prepared a report could not assert that the report contained the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, without some qualification, that qualification should be stated in the report. The sixth point is that if after an exchange of reports an expert witness changes his view on a material matter, having read the other side's expert's report, or for any other reason, such a change of view should be communicated through legal representatives to the other side without delay and where appropriate to the court. And the seventh point was that where expert evidence refers to photographs, plans, calculations, analyses, measurements, surveys and such like, these must be provided to the opposite party at the same time as the exchange of reports. So again, it's just so that there's a complete picture. The Supreme Court were very clear, they, was, they said in Cordia, it's in Kennedy versus Cordia, that in our view, Cresswell's uh, Justice Cresswell's guidance should be applied in the Scottish courts in civil cases. So, they they were very strongly in favour of the, the summary of uh, Justice Cresswell. The Supreme Court then went on to look at uh, matters under the heading of reliable body of knowledge or experience. Um, and they said, what amounts to a reliable body of knowledge or experience depends on the subject matter of the proposed skilled evidence. Uh, in Davy, which we've already looked at, the question for the court was whether blasting operations in the construction of a sewer had damaged the pursuer's building, and the relevant expertise included civil engineering and mining engineering. In Myers, Bragman and Cox, the subject matter was the activities of criminal gangs and a policeman's evidence which was the product of training courses and long-term personal experience as an officer serving with a body of officers who built up a body of learning was admitted as factual evidence of the practices of such gangs. The court said that in, case, in many cases where the 
the subject matter of the proposed expert evidence is within a recognised scientific discipline, it will be easy for the court to be satisfied about the reliability of the relevant body of knowledge. There's more difficulty where the science or body of knowledge is not widely recognised. And there's a reference to Walker and Walker, um, where there's a reference in turn to an obiter dictum of Lord Easy in the case of Merns against Smedvig Limited 1999, which is reported in session cases, in support of their proposition, that's Walker's proposition, that a party seeking to lead a witness with purported knowledge or experience out with generally recognised fields would need to set up by investigation and evidence not only the qualifications and expertise of the individual skilled witness, but the methodology and validity of that field of knowledge or science. The Supreme Court say in Kennedy, we agree with that proposition, which is supported in Scotland and in other jurisdictions by the court's refusal to accept the evidence of an expert whose methodology is not based on any established body of knowledge. Next heading that they looked at was making sure that the expert performs his or her role. And they said there, and this goes back to the remarks I made earlier on about um, the responsibilities of legal advisors, excuse me. It's, they said that it falls in the first instance to counsel and solicitors who propose to adduce the evidence of a skilled witness to assess whether the proposed witness has the necessary expertise and whether his or her evidence is otherwise admissible. And it's also their role to make sure that the proposed witness is aware of the duties imposed on an expert witness. As I said earlier, you've got an obligation to make sure that the witness knows his or her obligations. Uh, the legal team, this is going back to the Supreme Court, the legal team should also disclose to the expert all of the relevant factual material which they intend should contribute to the expert's evidence in addition to his or her own pre-existing knowledge. That should include not only material which supports their client's case, but also material of which they're aware that points in the other direction. And um, the skilled witness should, uh, should take into account and disclose in the written report, assuming there is a written report, the relevant factual evidence so provided. So again, this is just to do with there being disclosure of the facts and the material upon which the expert opinion is based. The next heading they looked at, policing the performance of an expert's duties. And um, they say there under that heading that it is not the normal practice of, a, of the Scottish courts to hold preliminary hearings or proofs on the admissibility of the evidence of skilled witnesses. Well, I've never heard of that happening. So, yep, I, really, in my experience, yes, it's certainly not the normal practice because I've never ever heard of that occurring at all. Um, maybe it does in certain uh, courts under commercial procedure, maybe, I don't know. But I've never come across that. But the court went on to say that considerations of cost and practicability may often make such a course unattractive. Where the court has significant powers of case management, as in com uh, certain actions based on clinical negligence or commercial actions, the court can address concerns about the evidence in the report by a skilled witness at a case management hearing and discuss with counsel how they're to be resolved. So again, you know, this is all under the heading of policing the performance of the expert's duties. The court goes on to say that in many cases it may not be possible to iron out all difficulties before the proof. A party may object to part or all of a skilled witness's evidence at the start and during the course of a proof, as occurred in this case. So, as I said at the outset, when I looked at, started looking at this case, Mr. Uh, Grizzly's evidence was heard under uh, objection. In the absence of objection, the judge should, when assessing whether and to what extent to give weight to the evidence, 
test the evidence to ascertain that it complies with the four considerations which is set out already, which I've referred to, um, and is otherwise sound. In McTeer against Imperial Tobacco Limited, uh, 2005 session cases, from memory that case takes up the entire volume. Um, Lord Nimmo Smith usefully described the judge's role in these terms. And I quote, this is Lord Nimmo Smith, it is necessary to consider with care in respect of each of the expert witnesses to what extent he was aware of and observed his function. I must decide what did or did not lie within his field of expertise and not have regard to any expression of opinion on a matter which lay out with that field. Where published literature was put to a witness, I can only have regard to such of it as lay within his field of expertise, and then only to such passages as were expressly referred to. Above all, the purpose of leading the evidence of any of the expert witnesses should have been to impart to me special knowledge of subject matter, including published material lying within the witness's field of expertise, so as to enable me to form my own judgment about that subject matter and the conclusions to be drawn from it. The last um, topic, as it were, that they looked at in the Supreme Court was economy and litigation. And they didn't say a great deal about this. Um, they did say, however, that in recent years there have been many statements of concern in many jurisdictions about the disproportionate cost of civil litigation. Scotland is no exception and these concerns include the use of expert witnesses. Now I, I, I see the point they're making there um, however going back to the question of uh, protecting your back as a practitioner my feeling here is that you can be damned if you do call an expert witness and damned if you don't um, I had a proof in October 2021 where there was an issue over photographs showing damage to vehicles. It was a road traffic case. And the issue that arose there was uh, an interpretation to be put on the, f the photographs, and in particular the damage that was shown in the photographs. And what that indicated or was likely to indicate as regards how the accident came about. Now, I've undertaken hundreds of road traffic cases in which the sheriff has felt able to interpret photographic evidence in relation to damage. Uh, for example, if there's a dent, that tends to suggest that the force was applied at right angles to the surface if there's a scrape, that tends to suggest it came in diagonally. These um, conclusions, if you like, are drawn from photographic evidence of, of, of damage all the time. Um, however, on this occasion, in this proof that I had in October of 2021, the summary sheriff said that without expert evidence, he could make no findings about damage to the vehicles. He could not take into account in determining how the accident is likely to have happened the damage as shown in the photographs. Um, now that essentially landed the solicitor in it because essentially what the court was saying there was you should have brought an expert witness. Um, so what do you do about this? Do you do you bring along an expert to every proof in which you have photographs of vehicle damage? I don't think so, but you can see why you'd be safer doing that. Um, on the other hand, um, I had a road traffic proof in Hamilton years ago now, um, and the principal agents on whom I for whom I was appearing had cited a, an expert witness, a retired traffic policeman to give his opinion on how an accident probably happened and the sheriff, Sheriff Stewart said that he didn't need that evidence to decide what had happened. Um, in fact he relied on photographic evidence of the damage. So that witness was brought along needlessly. 
So you can't, in a way, you can't win. Whatever you do, you're taking risks. Um, and I, I don't know what advice to give about that. Um, you just have to discuss it with the client and see what the client wants to do. That's always the best uh, approach. Uh, on the subject of unnecessary experts, I do remember that in the 1990s in Glasgow there was a, a tendency, a practice, of using child psychologists to speak to what they thought was or would be in the best interest of the children in terms of contact arrangements and such like. And um, my recollection is was, this was very much discouraged by the sheriffs and the practice did in fact die out. But again, you know, you can see why it might be safer to bring along witnesses. Just in case the sheriff takes the view and says, well, he or she can't make a, a finding that, that you want made without expert evidence. Um, it's one of these situations where you have to rely on judicial knowledge but making assumptions about judicial knowledge can be quite a risky business um, and of course if, you're, if your opponent has an expert then you may feel that you could be in bother if you don't bring along an expert as well so um, case management this was something that the, the Supreme Court looked at and What they said there was that case management offers a means by which a court can encourage parties to avoid leading evidence on matters which are not contentious. For example, by agreeing uh, a statement of fact which explains background matters which are not the subject of written pleadings. And um, there may be matters which can readily be agreed which allows e uh, parties experts to concentrate on contentious matters. Uh, solicitors with expertise in personal injury actions may use such statements as the basis for agreed evidence in other actions and thereby save expense. Uh, where that's not possible, the Supreme Court said, a court which has case management powers may require experts to exchange opinions, confer and prepare a report which identifies matters of agreement and reasons for any continued disagreement. Case management big thing these days when I when I started 30 years ago there really wasn't any case management everything was very much based on how the parties chose to present their case courts were not interventionist and that has completely changed particularly in certain fields of activity such as personal injury commercial family matters in my opinion that's only likely to increase uh, into other areas as well and um, as I say the Supreme Court refers to case management as uh, being something that can can uh, have an impact on the use of, of expert evidence and um, they make the point that uh, a court which has case management powers may require experts to exchange opinions, confer and prepare a report which identifies matters of agreement and reasons for any uh, continued disagreement. It can ascertain the scope for joint instruction of a single expert and where it possesses the necessary powers can exclude expert reports and evidence. And um, courts also possess powers in relation to expenses which can be used to discourage the excessive use of expert evidence. Um, again, you know, I, I get I get nervous when I hear about um, or I, I see references to courts dealing with uh, you know, these matters by ways of, by way of expenses. You know, I always think to myself that's that's another risk that we're facing as practitioners that um, we'll either not be able to recover expenses or we'll be hitting expenses or there'll be there'll be some consequence which will no doubt impact on us. Um, but I suppose expenses is the, the weapon that the court has to uh, try and control things where there's not case management. Um, so anyway, going back to the, this, this uh, Kennedy versus Cordia case, um, the, the Supreme Court um, basically said that the, the extra division had erred in treating 
much of the factual uh, material of Mr. Greasley's report as inadmissible on the basis that it was not skilled evidence that assisted the court. Uh, they also erred in excluding his evidence on how he would have carried out the risk assessment. Um, his expressions of opinion as to what the defender should have done were capable of being interpreted as legal opinions that uh, the defender had breached its statutory had breached statutory regulations. Um, and the, the Supreme Court took the view that the Lord Ordinary had applied his own mind to the legal questions which he had to decide. In other words, he hadn't abrogated his responsibilities to the expert. Um, the Supreme Court said that as in that case, the, the Kennedy case, it may on occasion be expedient to instruct a witness with general health and safety experience to give skilled evidence on a specific question of health and safety practice which he or she may not, not have encountered in the past. And such a witness may have to conduct research into how the particular risk might have been reduced or avoided. Uh, whether or not the witness has sufficient experience or knowledge to give skilled evidence is a matter which can be explored uh, either through case management or in cross-examination. Um, in this case, they said Mr. Greasley um, included in his uh, evidence material which his instructing solicitors had provided to him relating to the practices of other employers obtained from freedom of information requests. Um, the solicitors themselves did not give evidence. In such circumstances, it is as a matter of fairness incumbent on the solicitors to disclose to the skilled witness and to the other parties in the litigation the relevant material which they've assembled, whether or not it supports their case. So again, full disclosure. Um, it is not clear in this case whether there was any undisclosed material. And then the last point they make, made there um, was in relation to economy uh, in litigation and they said that uh, there was no suggestion that Miss Kennedy's advisors had adopted an uneconomic approach to the litigation and they made the point that the proof consisted of two witnesses, herself and Mr Greasley. There were only two witnesses. Um, so, uh, as I said at the outset, that case is something, it's a case that you must read if you use or intend to use or are considering using any kind of uh, skilled witness or skilled evidence in a, in a case. Um, I've spent a fair bit of time on it, but I think that was justified given its importance. The case uh, is a long, long report and um, as I said, given that it's a Supreme Court decision, it pretty well supplants all the, the earlier case law on this and the textbooks. Um, what will be interesting though is how other courts apply the uh, law as set out in uh, Kennedy against Cordia and how you as practitioners uh, choose to um, implement the duties that the court has said are incumbent upon you uh, should you be using expert witnesses. So I hope that um, what I've said here is, is useful. Um, just remember, keep up to date with developments because in the area of expenses in particular, these things are ever changing and uh, make sure that you read that Cordia case. And I hope that what I've said is a, has been of assistance to you and um, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>